I invite you to look at the Bible with fresh eyes today. Scripture tells history, poetry, theology, words of wisdom. But there's a story behind that. There's a spiritual message behind it. And whereas the stories of the Bible seem to relate to long ago, far away, they seem to relate to the children of Israel, to a land that we're not familiar with, to, to other places and other times, there's a spiritual story behind the Scripture that applies to each of our lives. That's the story that I want to see today. We will be looking at the history of of the children of Israel, the history of their, of their conquest of the promised land. But we will be looking at a choice that was placed before them that day and that is placed before all of us, each of us, every day. And certainly today. Today, I would ask you the same question. I'd lay before you the same choice that Joshua placed before the children of Israel on that day. Let's hear the word of the Lord. Today's scripture reading is Joshua 24, 13 through 15. I gave you a land on which you had not labored, and towns that you had not built, and you live in them. You eat the fruit from the vineyards and the orchard, orchard yards that you did not plant. Now therefore, revere the Lord, and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods of your ancestors, serve beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. Now if you're unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors served in the region beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you're now dwelling. But as for me and my household, we will follow the Lord. Amen. We're all familiar with that verse in its abbreviated form. Choose this day whom you will serve, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. There are placards on some of our houses. For me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But I think that what we have left out of the abbreviation is vital to our understanding of this. Now, he talked about, you think, well, he's talking about uh, how many gods is he talking about here? I think the Holy Bible is about a discovery of God anyway. I think it's, it's, it's humans coming to an understanding of what God is like and what the spirit world is like. At first, they thought that gods were located, even though an idol perhaps can be moved around, the God cannot. This is the God of a river, God of a mountain, God of a nation, God of a land, God of a territory. And it was considered that that God would rule over that area and that if you changed locations, you changed gods and you changed allegiances. That's certainly how uh, even Abraham felt when he was growing up. He was, he was if I back up to 24.2, and Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, long ago your ancestors, Terah, and his sons Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates, and served other gods. Even Abraham, then known as Abram, served other gods. And then Yahweh, Jehovah, the God of all gods, says, Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan and made his offspring many. You remember God promised him the land of Canaan, the land flowing with milk and honey, and promised it to you and your offspring, and I will make them as numerous as the stars in the sky, as the sand by the seashore. God made a promise to Abraham God, the ultimate God, came to Abraham and said, you're no longer going to serve a local God because you're going to be on the move and you're going to serve me wherever you go. Some of us once had an incomplete idea of God. So Abraham is serving this God and then, then he, Yahweh comes and takes him by the hand and says, through you all the nations will be blessed. That is, through you, Christ will come through you. The, the awareness of the one true God will be made known. Through you, people will stop worshiping territorial gods and, and temporal gods and will be worshiping the God of a people and then ultimately the God of all people. 
But they had a choice. They could always back up and worship the same gods that Terah and Abraham did. And they could have said, well, honor your father and your mother. Uh, we are children of Abraham. Abraham's a child of Terah. Terah worshipped some other god. Terah worshipped gods on the other side of the Euphrates. Terah was worshipping other gods. And therefore, we will honor our father, our ancestors, our upbringing, and we will worship those gods. I don't think you have to worship those gods to honor that person. You don't have to worship the gods of your fathers, the gods of your ancestors, in order to honor your ancestors. But they could have. Choose this day. Whether he said, whether the gods beyond the river, that's what he's talking about, beyond the Euphrates River, or the gods in Egypt. We grew up with an idea of God, didn't we? We all grew up on the other side of the Euphrates. We all grew up with, a, with an incomplete idea of God. It's an innocent and sweet idea of God. Oh, that we could return to that day. Oh, that we could have that sweet innocence. That, that Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. All of us knew that song before we knew anything about what the Bible actually said, didn't we? It would be great to return to that simplicity. It would be great to be able to worship God like my father and my mother worshipped God. In that case, I would be a Methodist in a little church somewhere. That would be wonderful and it would be easy. But I'm not called to do that. My parents may be called to do that. I'm not. I was called to something else. So we go through life and things get complicated and, 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 and we, we ride coattails of our brothers or whatever and we end up in Egypt where we are honored and then all of a sudden the Pharaoh changes, the leadership changes and next thing you know you're slaves in Egypt. We've all been servants of other people. We've all been subordinate to other people. We've all been taught at some time. I'm sure that you all felt captive in your school system or at other times in your life in your place of employment. And there you get yet another concept of God. Now somebody is teaching you a concept of God. You're not learning from the, from the example of your parents. You're being taught a concept of God. It's almost being forced on you. And you accept it because, after all, that's the safe way to go. You could worship the gods of Egypt. When the children of Israel were roaming through the wilderness, they said, well, that we could go back to Egypt. How easy things were in Egypt. We all had shelter in Egypt. We all had, a, had, had plenty to eat back in Egypt and some variety in our diet. They forgot about the pain of their slavery and they remembered the security of their slavery, the security of those gods in Egypt. You can serve the gods on the other side of the Euphrates. You can serve the gods you left in Egypt. It's your choice. Interesting thing about that is that we look back on slavery in this nation. Real thing. Not all that old. In fact, the 1800s. This nation still had slaves. And slaves were taught the Bible and slaves were taught the Christian religion because after all, the churches of that day, some of the churches of that day, were looking at the examples of slavery and the, the instructions on how slaves were to behave and were saying, see there, the, the Bible says it, it's God's will, that's the way it goes. And so those slaves in that day accepted the faith of their masters, but then it got away from them, didn't it? Because all of a sudden, they stopped serving the gods of Egypt and they start serving the one true God. They look in the scripture and suddenly they see God himself and they see that God wants to set the captives free and that God wants liberty for all and that God is God loves them and suddenly they start identifying with the children of Israel being freed from Egypt and the next thing you know slavery is no more. You can go back to the gods of your slavery or the gods of your forefathers and choose this day and you serve. And then you got the gods of the Amorites. Here they come. They're in a nation that they didn't build. They're living in cities they didn't build. They're, they're eating grapes they didn't plant. They're eating from olive yards they didn't plant. You know, we're all in that situation. We're all in that situation. Now, I know that we are building and investing and growing and I know that we have been doing that for years and some of you have been doing that for many, many years and that's great. But let's face it. All of us came to a town that we didn't build. We drove in here on roads that we didn't pay. We're living in a church. We're worshiping in a church that we didn't build. I know you had a part in it. We're, we're worshiping 
a, a concept that we don't have. We're, we're studying Bibles that we didn't write. We didn't do this work. This work was handed to us. God used the people who went before us to give us something. Just like He used the Amorites to build these cities and to plant these vineyards and to plant these olives. And, to, and, to, and when, the, when the children of Israel came there, God had driven them away with the hornets and God had given the army strength. And now they're here in the land of the Amorites, in the land of Canaan, the land flowing with milk and honey. And everywhere they go, there's another temple, another altar, another monument, another idol, another statue. Oh, these are the gods of the Amorites. And if there's a few Amorites left, they say, yeah, well, that's the gods that made our grapes grow so big. And that's the gods that, that kept our homes secure. And that's the gods that did all this for us. And it's tempting to say, well, if God is a God of a territory, then maybe the God of the Amorites is still the God of this place. Maybe we should worship that God. And, and Joshua is just stating the facts. He can't force them to worship anyway, any particular concept of God, any particular picture of God. You can worship an idol. You can worship the true God. Now therefore revere the Lord and serve Him with sincerity and faithfulness. He's already reviewed for them all the miracles that God did for them. The deliverance, the, the parting of the Red Sea, the parting of the River Jordan, the, the, uh, the defense of the, against the armies of Egypt and, and having sent the hornets out to, to drive away and to weaken the armies of the Amorites before they got there. Serve Him with sincerity and faithfulness. Put away the gods that your ancestors served beyond Egypt. Terah and his people, Abraham's parents. And in Egypt, gods of slavery, gods of, of subservience, gods of subordination, and serve the Lord. Now if you're unwilling to serve the Lord, then choose this day whom you will serve. But the gods of your ancestors served, the region beyond the river, the gods of the Amorites, where we are now. As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. My grandfather preached until he was 98. He preached in the log cabin one Saturday night. He passed away the following Wednesday. After he had finished writing his sermon for the next log cabin service. I had the honor of reading that after he was gone. He made it to 98. True man of God, I, I wanted to be like him so much. When he would smoke his pipe, I'd smoke my bubble pipe. I wanted to be like Grandpa. But he used to tell me, he said, Joel, God doesn't have any, grandpa, any grandchildren. God doesn't have any grandchildren. I could be like Grandpa, and I would be doing what God called Grandpa to do, not what God called me to do. God has no grandchildren. See, what I'm saying is, the, the spiritual story behind the story we're talking about here is that it's all well and good for your parents to have been Christians. I know that we were raised in Christian communities, in Christian households, in Christian churches. We are blessed by that. But it really wouldn't matter if they're church serving the one true God or a false God. You're not going to get to God through your parents or through your grandparents. They may have set a great example, but God is calling you to do something, and you're not going to do it if you think that God is calling me to imitate my parents. No, not. Not. Maybe God is calling me to, to, to worship as I've been taught to worship, to, to worship like my bosses did, like my siblings did, like everyone else. No. No, or like my neighbors do. Maybe if I'm in, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. Here I am, and I've got to learn the ways of this territory, the ways of this church, the ways of these people, and worship exactly like they do. We can't. These are all good and useful lessons. We don't ignore these things. But we have to remember that God is calling you to more. God, If God is calling you to more than you are, then even if you get like your parents, or like your neighbors, or like your teachers, even if you become just like them, it's still the case that God is calling you to more. Oh, I want to honor my parents, and my parents were this kind of Christian and went to this kind of church. Perhaps I should do that. You know, there are New Testament verses that are very hard for me to take, and they start making more sense when I look at that spiritual story behind the story. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 34, Do not think that I've come to bring peace on earth. I have not come to bring peace but a sword. For I've come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother. A daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And the one's foes will be the members of one's own household. 
Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their lives will lose them. Those who lose their lives for my sake will find them. That's a pretty harsh statement. And you say, okay, well, I love Jesus more than I love. And we, we, we try to say that. We say, well, I love Jesus differently. Betterly. I don't know if that's a word. We, we love Jesus more in a way. It's, it's even worse if you go to, the, to Luke's quotation of this. Or Now large, Luke 14, 25. Now large crowds were traveling with Jesus. And Jesus turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate, that's an accurate translation. Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Boy, there's an impossible statement. And I don't have to go, I don't have to flip the page too many times. Too many times in either direction to find Jesus say, honor your father and mother. Love all children, particularly your own children. Love your brothers and sisters. I don't have to go very far to say that's not right. Jesus is, is telling me to hate. Whoever comes to me and does not hate. And yet everywhere else Jesus is telling me not to hate anybody. So I have to look deeper. If I'm going to make sense of that, I have to look deeper in behind this. And I find the key to this, I find the answer to this back in the story of Joshua. It's not saying hate your mother and father. But God's calling you to be you, not your mother and father. It doesn't say hate your brother and sister, but God's calling you to something different, not to be your brother or sister. God is calling us to something else, always calling us to something deeper, always calling us to something more. God has no grandchildren. If you're here and you're saying that, that I'm here because I want to hear the Word of God, you know, Christianity didn't make sense to me. I really couldn't accept it until I read the Scripture for myself and started getting a sense of this story behind the story. Because we all start on the other side of the Euphrates as children, accepting what's given to us without question, benefiting from it or not, but receiving what we receive. And then all of us go through a time of learning, a time of enslavement, if you will, or servanthood, a time in which we are being handed and taught and, and, and we're being told that, no, you're, you're wrong and I'm right and just do what I say. Just hear what I hear. Just listen to the lesson I'm trying to teach you. And indeed, we can learn some true stuff from that. We can learn to make bricks. We can learn something from that. And then there's, but, but God has promised us something else that's not our enslavement. And then we move, we go through the wilderness, we go through doubt, and eventually we come into a new place where there's new gods and there's new customs. And what are we going to do? Well, we're going to follow the gods of our fathers, the gods of our enslavement, the gods of this new place that we are. Is that the spirit of our worship? No. Choose this day, Joshua said, whom you will serve. It's not saying that you literally hate your mother and father. But God is calling you today to new faith. Today to new faith. Today. You are not dishonoring your, your ancestors, your father and mother, the church you used to go to, the church that was here yesterday, you're not dishonoring anybody by following God more closely, by following the teachings of Jesus directly, by praying for God to show, Lord, show us what are we supposed to do in this day and age? What, you know, we, we spend a lot of time trying to figure out how can we get back to where we were in 2001, in 95, in 78, in 84. Where can we get back where we were in 2012, 2013? How can we regain the spirit that we had? Amen. Go back to Egypt. Amen. Go back across the Euphrates. God is calling us to something today. God is calling us to something today. Something new. We don't know what it is. Something important. We don't know what it is. Something spirit-filled. We don't know what it is. But he's always calling us to go deeper. He's never calling us to imitate anybody. No matter how beloved they are. No matter how smart they are. No matter how holy they are. We are going to the living God. God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. 
God is not the God of yesterday, but the God of today. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, choose you this day whom you will serve, the God of your forefathers, the gods of your slavery, the gods of this region. That's for me and my house. We will serve the Lord. Amen.